to me, I'm like, I got to be more merciful to myself than I'm not holding myself to some unobtainable standard. And just knowing that like, it's not up to me to do everything or save the world and that God is in control of my kid's life, my life and the world. And he's going to just slowly give us little steps of obedience. That's all I can do when I'm like breaking down in tears, like, what do I do? God, should I work? Should I stay home? Should I? He's going to only give me that next step. He, even though it makes me so mad, I wish he would give us a letter of like the next five years. He's just like, take this one next step. I know what that is. You know what that is. Even if we try and deny it. So that's where I'm at. What does the Lord require of us, mama? Hi, welcome to Wild and Beautiful. We're Joanna Hyatt and Lauren Enriquez, your co-hosts who every week are helping you live out your faith in a way that's biblically rooted, but culturally relevant. Friends, you are in for a treat today. Uh, We talk about this person a lot on our podcast, if you've been listening, and now you finally get to meet her. She's she's not an imaginary friend. She's our real friend. Allison Santafante is joining us on the show today. Welcome, Allison. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to make my debut on the show. You guys are my favorite, obviously. You know, my we have a three group text chat. chat. The three of us constantly are pinging stuff back and forth. She's very impressive in her own right. What were you gonna say? No, no, no. I was just saying, I'm I'm the forgotten soul on the left on the text thread. So sometimes I just listen to your podcast to know what you guys are talking about. Because I mean, they're like running around with children or working. And so I forget to, and I have 72 messages from you and Lauren. It's bad. We it's call Enriquez. Bad. Like, because yes. we're so just Enriquez. There was too many Laurens uh, in our life at one time. So um, I'm happy to be on. It's so exciting. You're, I'm so proud of you. I love this show. Thanks. I love it. Thanks so much. We are having a blast and people have been super supportive. Um, things you should know about Allison from the get-go. Uh, she has a delightful husband. He's like really one of the best. Mr. David, he's my favorite Italian. They have two kids that are adorable. If you follow her on Instagram, you will see that her youngest child never stops smiling, like ever, 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 ever. So good. It's, I signed I mean, up. I'll has, get 10 more if they're all like She has a perpetual <laughs> grin on her face all the time, which I don't, I mean, and I've met this child in person and it's true. It's not a filter that Allison's putting on the kid. So mm-hmm. there's that. Uh, But then Allison has done a lot. You've done a lot in the space of really pushing back on abortion. And you're the pit bull that everybody wants in their corner when it comes to this, because you are not afraid to go on Fox and tackle it. You're not afraid to tackle it online with people. And your stories are always covering it. And I think that's what's so refreshing for people is it like, here's a mom doing the thing. Um, And so I'm excited. Yeah, you you know, it's so weird. That stuff's not scary to me at all. Like, People are like, how did you do like a Tucker Carlson interview like three weeks postpartum? That's fun for me because I'm <laughs> weird. That's fun for me. You know what's hard for me sometimes is like going to like story time puppet hour and being like, <laughs> do I want to talk about anything? Or can I tell you about the news story I just read? Are you going to think I'm so weird? So thank you. I've got to do some cool things, but I'm in the throes of raising little. That's really cool too. And a whole nother like muscle to flex and figure out and work. And that's just what you and I talk about all the time. And the time. we're not alone in it. I like jumped on Instagram no. and vented one night. Like, what are we doing? Should we, what are we doing? Like half of the women in my thread are fighting a good fight of like justice. And like, it's anti-sex trafficking rallies. And they're like, writing books and they're doing podcasts. And then there's like the other half that's like churning butter and like running through fields with their children. They're homeschooling them and they're breastfeeding till they're five. And you're like, am I doing anything right? And then some people like you, Joe, are like beautifully doing both somehow. Oh, thank you. I make my children churn the butter. (laughs) So it's like, (laughs) it's it's something this, this era that we're trying to figure out motherhood in. But even I struggle, and I I think you bring up a great point. We see people, and even we can know people really well, and still not fully get maybe where they're feeling like they're dropping the ball, or they're feeling like they're not measuring up. And and I listen. I don't know if that's new to our generation because we have so many options that it's almost paralyzing to know which is the best option. I mean, have you? Mm-hmm. You probably haven't started reading yet. Like Little House on the Prairie. There is not, you know, a a plethora of options for these women. You just, you knew what your job was. It was to nail it on the home front. You had to churn that butter. You do the crops. 
do the clothing. And I mean, thank goodness I don't have to wash the clothes by hand. Whoa. But there's something to, they knew what the role was. And I'm so grateful we have options, but I find sometimes the options are paralyzing. Yeah. Yeah. It's a really good point. You know, you think back to that time where you just woke up and you knew you did the dang thing. You kept the children alive, the house running, because if you didn't, you didn't have wood for the fireplace. You didn't have food, you know, whatever. Now we have all these like modern conveniences, grocery stores and ovens and (laughs) Uber Eats if you need it. And, you know, you and I have grown up under the tutelage of so many women who said, lean in, you can do it all. You can have it all. And, and like an elevation of you can do anything like a man can do. And, you know, I was in DC for 10 years and I would look around and I would see some of these women who did that and were doing it. And and I don't think many of them were really happy at the end of the day. I mean, like, and so, you know, my dad always used to say to me, oh, a smart person learns from their own mistakes and a wise person learns from the mistakes of others. And I'd be like, well, what can we learn? I mean, give me good female role models. I used to, I used to travel a lot with these presidents of different nonprofits. And you could talk about anything, Joanna. And the first question at a college campus from a girl will be, how do you do it? How are you the president and have kids? They, it's on the tip of every girl's mind. Like yep. you want both. You want the desires of your heart of like, I want a family. I also want to like affect good change in the world or um, and so I just, yeah, I would look at some of these women that were like 50, 60. And I'm like, you, you know, they're going home on the subway with me. I'm eating ramen. They're eating ramen. I'm like, why are you eating ramen? You're 55. You should, I'm, you know, like, what are we, what is the end goal of like what we're pursuing? Right. And so, yeah, I just felt like this change in myself where in my twenties, it was really fun to work late and be like, I can't go to happy hour. I got to work late. I got to work on this press conference, press release to that. Because it made you feel needed. Mm -hmm. And I feel like other women understand that. Like you're in the throes of corporate world. It makes you feel needed. But then now I'm in my 30s and I'm like, there's nothing appealing to me about late nights at my desk at the sacrifice of like spending time with my kids. Like it's not cute to have like wine and Chinese food as my kids are like crying out for me. You know what I mean? Like, so I'm changing and you're actually needed by people. Like, Yes. The twenty is anyone could write a press release. Anyone can do my job, even though you like to think you're irreplaceable. When it's your children that need really you, that's been like a needed feeling that's been new to me, how strongly I've like, I've felt that draw. And I'm, I'm, you know, I think figuring out a little bit of, can you do both? Can you do, you know, completely present parenting and also taking on things that matter to you. Or for some people that are listening, maybe you're just like, I'm not fighting social justice, but I need the money. I need to financially support it. Maybe I'm a single mom. You, you know, you had a tough time there for a little bit as a young mom. If you want to talk about that, we feel, I feel like we be clear. I was not a single mom. My husband's always been a picture. (laughs) (laughs) No, I'm just giving you a hard time. It's true though. You know, as I'm hearing you say like, needed. You're like, absolutely. Nobody needs you more than kids. But I do think there is a tension there because it's not always as affirming as a paying job is. Like you write the press release, people notice, people applaud you. You know, adults are more quickly, there's metrics. You're like, for me, it was fundraising. I was like, great. I raised X amount of dollars. Good job. Uh, For parenting can feel a lot of like, I know these children need me to make the bazillionth dish of food again and make sure I cut the sandwich properly to avoid a meltdown. But is, am I, am I really making any impact now that I have older kids, a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old, I can tell you, yes, you absolutely are. But those beginning years, and you and I talk about this a lot where I'm like, you're in the hard years because you have toddlers. Every season is is difficult in its own way, but there is something unique about the toddler years that can feel so uh, just delightful <laughs> and also <laughs> numbing because there's not you're not really seeing is this working out well? Like is my parenting paying off? Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think there's seasons uh, of of what it looks like. I mean, you and I met when we worked full-time for a a national pro-life organization. And I, at that point, did I have two kids already? Three? Two or three? Three. I don't know, we have a lot. Um, So I had three kids. I was working full-time. I'm actually pregnant. And they all end up getting the same haircut. So I'm like, I can't. 
I know. When my <laughs> oldest rebelled and decided to grow her bangs out, I was like, and so it begins. So it begins. Mm-hmm. You're done. <laughs> Great. Next, you're going to steal the car. Grow your bangs out first, steal the car next, sneak out of the house. Uh, but yeah, I, I, you know, and and I think there's seasons of like why you're working and the kind of work you're doing and the hours it fills. So even though I had three mm-hmm. kids, I would have never pictured myself as a quote unquote working mom uh, because that's not how my mom was. Like she had side things. And so you just think, well, I guess this is what it looks like to be a godly woman is you stay home and you become a doormat <laughs> for your family. And then we were on welfare and, uh, and my husband hadn't had work for, what was it, two years? And, mm-hmm. and this organization approached me and my mouth said yes, and my stomach dropped out of the bottom. Um, and I worked there for five years, and it was what what carried us. It's really what God used to pull us out of welfare, to allow us to be able to buy our first home. Um, and during that time, my husband kept riding in the cracks, and eventually work picked up. But I had to realize like it was not a bad thing, and I am not a lesser mom for working because this is how God is choosing to provide for our family. Mm-hmm. And that, yeah, I, think, I, I think you're also, we, everyone's different and you, mm-hmm. your personality is such that you can handle so much and you do great with a lot. And, you know, I, I, I wish she was on here, but I was thinking as you're talking, I don't know if Enrique has shared this on the show about her wanting to be a sister of perpetual adoration. Oh, she has. It's pretty okay. crazy to me that she wanted to go into a convent and now has, almost five children and and is like the best writer communicator like writer and so just both paths would be beautiful and both like worship the lord like and but yeah as her friend i'm like i'm so glad that you're out of there so i can ask you all the thoughts and she's so brilliant um but to realize that as a woman we are made to have a fight for our children and how like you're made to be concern. Like there's just something in us as moms that is like hormonal and biological. And I think God given, it's why in the middle of the night when the baby cries and my husband says, she's fine, go back to bed. I'm like, I have to check. She could have a hand in the crib slat or if she could have gotten bit by a spider or pooped or it's too hot. Why don't you think like this, man? And it's because I'm the mom. <laughs> and I think we've kept civilizations alive because of it, you know? Yep. And it's like, that's good. And you know, to go into like some emotions, I was really struggling. You know this, since that, you know, having little ones of like, I would either call you or call my husband, leaving my oldest at daycare, and just feeling so torn up. And I know I'm not alone in that because when I share about it, moms are like, "Yeah, like my husband never has that guilt." And I'm not here to dog on men; they're just different. God has given them; they provide straight line protect straight line. Ours protection looks different when you're a woman. Is it keeping you close to me? Is it letting me rate, like do some money-making jobs so that you, we can do other things together and I can provide for you? Our provide and protect looks different. Mm, I like that. But, but because what am I providing? Is it like around the clock present care? That's what I need. Or is it provision of other sorts, like memories and clothes and whatever your situation is? And I want to be sensitive. Some yeah, There are single moms. There are moms that need, they don't have a network or you know, you have family close by. I don't. Like, I work full time here for and now I'm trying to do consulting. We're figuring it out together. But there's something biological about moms and babies that I think we all can't deny. And when I did a little informal poll on my um, Instagram, 86% of people that responded said they were considering pulling their kid out of like public school just because of the way of the world. And I'm like, that's a lot of people. In order to homeschool or put them in private school? One or the other. Just realizing like, you know what? The way the world's spinning, yeah. I want to make sure, like nothing's more important to me than my kids knowing who they are and feeling like I protected them from, they're going to go through stuff. Right. But that my house was shade for them. The world's so stinking hot right now on so many levels that I want to make sure they know that there was some shade here. That like, if they got into some stuff, they're going to pursue that heat. I did it, you did it. But you knew home was safe. like I, my yes. my interest was to create a foundation where you felt safe and you knew the truth and you knew that I had your back and we have we have a relationship where you're not feeling alone out in the heat, you know. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm 
I feel like I'm a work in progress. I wish you all had Joanna as a friend to call in those moments. One of the best things you ever said to me though was, and you can just keep saying it. You say, this is the hardest part. Mm -hmm. And you, you said it already. Like it is hard when you're raising littles and I've seen glimmers of it. Like, oh, they sit and they play together. I have a two and a half year old, 10 month old. They play and I'm like, oh, I could write an email right now. Like I could, uh, there is them entertaining each other. There is, a, a, you know, a light at the end of like the, I'm their only friend. I'm a constant needed person. But I go back to, to bring it back to, you know, I know the show is culturally relevant and biblically rooted. I was thinking of Micah 6, 8, like, um, what does the Lord require of us? And I, t- I put, what does the Lord require of us? Oh, mama. Hmm. And it's even if it's just, oh, human, oh, man, it's do justice, love mercy and walk humbly. And I think the biggest thing that I'm figuring out is what is doing justice look like raising littles? Because half of me thinks doing justice is doing justice to their childhood by protecting their innocence as much as possible. And the other half of me wants to go out there with like swords and like shields and like fight city councils and library associations and, you know, abortion clinics and legislators, like all of those worthy battles. And so I hope I'm praying, I'm trying to figure out ways to do both. I think so many women are, but just going back that I also am going to have to love mercy and walk humbly and humbly is going to look like I can't do everything like I used to do when I was 23 and I would stay up late and fight all the battles and only had me and my belly to worry about. Now I've got others and their bellies and their booties to worry about, you know, like, um, and what, like, what does loving mercy look like as a mom? I mean, maybe you can jump in on this, but to me, I'm like, I gotta be more merciful to myself than I'm not holding myself to some unobtainable standard. And just knowing that like, it's not up to me to do everything or save the world and mm. that God is in control of my kid's life, my life and the world. And he's going to just slowly give us little steps of obedience. That's all I can do when I'm like breaking down in tears, like, what do I do? God, should I work? Should I stay home? Should I? He's going to only give me that next step. He, even though it makes me so mad, I wish he would give us a letter of like the next five years. He's just like, take this one next step. Yes, I know what that is. You know what that is. Even if we try and deny it. So that's where I'm at. What does the Lord require of us, Mama? <laughs> well, and, and again, I, that's why I think it changes with seasons, right? Like, mm. yeah, I've always put before the Lord once I started to have kids, like, I found I really enjoy working outside the home um, or when we're doing our consulting things and I'm on calls and I'm, I'm helping people strategize. Like, there is a part of me that is fulfilled. And, you know, part of it is it's just this walk of faith to say, Lord, I, I trust that one— you will only ask um, of me what is good for not only myself, but my family. And sometimes that means working. You know, I'm thinking of those 86% that want to pull their kids out of the public school. Well, to homeschool or to private school requires some sacrifice and commitment. Uh, You either have to pay more um, or you're going to have to give of your time. And so you say, okay, Lord, what is best for this season of my life for my children? Is it that I work more so that they can go to a school where they're instructed really well? Or is it that I bring them into the home and I lay aside some things in order to to focus in and pour in? And I don't think there's one right way, honestly. It's like you can find justification uh, for both in Proverbs 31, the women uh, of, of righteousness. But so it's it's trusting that the Lord is going to say, okay, here's what's good for you. But in that, a big one for me has been also trusting that the Lord is not going to forget me. Hmm. And that's that's where I find such comfort in the story of Hagar from the Old Testament, that she's out there and she's weeping. She's like, my son's going to die. And, and they're basically out in the desert as a result of Abraham and Sarah trying to bring the promise about in their own way. And that was a hot mess, disaster. And she calls the Lord El Roy, the God who sees me. And I think for women in no Mm. matter what culture we're in, and I think we are in one of the most um, privileged, blessed, uh, advantageous times women have ever been able to live in for any number of things, both our safety, delivering kids, options to work, figure out how to kind of do all the things. And yet I have found a lot of times as I go more into the home, I worry, Lord, are you going to forget me? Are you going to forget that you made me to be a fighter? Are you going to forget that you made me with these certain skills? 
uh, you know, because I'm like you. I'm like, let's go. City council, do it. Not everybody loves that, turns out. I found out not even Enriquez loves that. What? But uh, but I'm like, okay, but God, that, then you made us fighters. You need fighters out there. And knowing that, yes, God made each of us different ways, and he will utilize that to the fullness for the kingdom, and he will not forget us. But what that looks like and that that living out of those giftings and that calling is going to change year by year, season by season, you know, whatever it may be. And having our small kids is totally different than when we have teenagers and what they need from us and and the ways we interact. So yeah, for me, I think also that justice and that it's like, man, I if I find that I am repeatedly short with my kids, it's probably because I am distracted by other things and I have to reevaluate and go, okay, I'm not balancing it well. What do I need to cut out in order to be more merciful to my kids in my day-to-day interactions? Because yeah. they are what they are. Like they can't be, they can't be helping that they need me to put them on the toilet again because they can't reach the dang thing or they need a sandwich made. <laughs> that's yeah. not their fault. <laughs> no. And you know, I think that's a cool thought practice too. It's like in those tough moments of, you know, battling a two-year-old's brilliant strategies to delay bedtime. Like, where else would you rather be? Like, yeah. and I don't say that to sound cliche, but like last night I was laying on the floor thinking, like literally telling my oldest, who's two and a half, I just want to go to bed. Like, can you just go to bed, please? Like, let's just do this. Like, please go to bed. And she thought, I need a new heater, mommy. I don't like that space. <laughs> I don't want that heater. I want a different heater in your office. And I went and got it. And it was so sweet. She goes, thanks, mom, as I close the door. And I'm like, that's like, I'm so exhausted. But I knew if I was on a work trip, Mm. I would be dying to do that. Because I remember that. Like, I remember working full time and going on a work trip out to California and being like on the baby monitor, like, what's going on? Like, which way are you sleeping? Did they put the swaddle on right? Like, and so I'm just, I'm just thinking that, We've come so far as women, like the pendulum is almost like swinging back. Like, okay, we we had modern advances and conveniences. We can do anything. I mean, you've got Venus and Serena Williams. You've got um, Condoleezza Rice. You've got brilliant, strong women that have, we've got Amy Coney Barrett. Like they can do it. We know we can, but what, what do you want? You don't, mm-hmm. we've proven that we can't. Now I'm seeing this whole revolution of like women, young girls, younger than me, not even married. Joanna, they're like, I'm getting off birth control. I want a homestead. I want to raise my family. That's all that matters to me. And not to go back to the fifties, like not, they're not going to be oppressed. They're like, that's I how think that's like the 1800s. Then, then like, oh my God, they're, they're like, turning their own butter. That's <laughs> true. It's probably really good. But like, they just don't want to sit at a cubicle or at a computer like we've realized like, you know what? That's really not the vision of my life that I want for forever. Maybe for a season, like you said, but not for forever. And these girls are pursuing like family and that's what they want. And that's that's pretty cool to see young girls, 20 somethings, really pushing back against this moment saying like, I'll climb the corporate ladder and I will jump off when I'm ready and do what I want. Well, and this pendulum, like you said, this pendulum swing from, we kind of just left the girl boss period. Like that was really strong before COVID, right? Like woman who runs a business, the woman who does this, da, 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 da. And Mm -hmm. you and I talk a lot about how feminists are always kind of angry that women would choose, choose to parent and choose motherhood as their, as their primary vocation. And again, there's, I know a lot of people who are listening to this, you are juggling both. And so but I also know you're like, my primary is my kids. And then my secondary is my photography business as a realtor, whatever these things are. And they they actually probably strengthen you as a parenting. I felt like I was a better mom uh, for having worked because it made me more disciplined and all these things. But even Cheryl Sandberg stepped away from Facebook uh, last year. And this is what she said in, in an interview she had. She said, this job has been the honor and privilege of a lifetime. I mean, she was the COO of Facebook. She wrote the book on women leaning in, you can have it all. But then she says, this job does not leave a lot of time to do other things. As she got married this summer, remarried, her husband had died, and she now has five kids. You know, so you just start to see her. And then to, you mentioned Serena Williams. She retired from tennis. And she said, these days, if I have to choose between building my tennis resume and building my family, I choose the latter. 
Like mm-hmm. what? Yeah. <laughs> That's really cool. Which, I, I I think, yeah, I love that we are in this place where we can say, you know what, right now I'm going to go hard after this goal and then I'm going to pivot and I'm going to go hard after this other goal. And then I'm going to do both. I mean, the Super Bowl, you had Rihanna up there basically announcing to the world her second pregnancy. And she is at the height of her musical career, literally performing like 70 feet up in the air. But what a testimony to young women yeah. that you, the lie of the abortion industry that you have to sacrifice one for the other is just that it's a lie. You do not actually. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I like a woman that's like real about it. I mean, I'm mm-hmm. kind of like, <laughs> I mean, I want to hear Rihanna's like thoughts as she was like, okay, what am I wearing on my like pregnant body? Like, what if I have to pee? And I'm like 70 feet in the air, like all these things. Um, Maybe she's wearing a catheter. Part of this is realizing that like social media is not real. I mean, the people that, no. like I was saying earlier, like half the people that are doing kind of like they're glamorizing motherhood, which is mm-hmm. good. There's a good part of that. Like we need that. We need to show people like it's beautiful and it's wonderful because it is. But that's not the full story. Like, you know that there were still meltdowns. Their children are not perfect. You know, whatever. That's half the story. The women that I see on my feed who I know have children but never share them because they're they're just fo- using their platform for work. It's like, that's cool too. But I also know that that's half the story. Like mm-hmm. there's sacrifice there. There's maybe, you know, meltdowns at drop off. There's hard feelings. There's missed things. And, and there's sacrifices on both sides. And I, I think this is a really good analogy. My, my neighbor, Mike, who I walk and talk with sometimes when I walk the baby outside in the stroller, he's older. He's like a military war vet, Joe. So of course I have to talk about my problems because he's seen like warfare. He's been like <laughs> shot at. I'm like, I need your thoughts. What should I do? He, we're talking and he listens to me and we, we just chat and he just, he's a really good guy. And he goes, listen, I don't know how to say this respectfully and politely, but I'm just... I'm just really struggling with like, what, what do women want? And I was like, that's it, Mike. I don't know. You're right. <laughs> like, <laughs> You're like, we want it all. Actually, we would like to live on 20 acres, mm-hmm. be the boss of our own company and also mm-hmm. be like there for all the important moments of our kids and yeah. the ones but we don't know are important. Full, a form like a full thought and yeah. you know, all these things. And it was just so funny. He's like, I don't know what women want. And I'm like, I don't know either. And we're all different. But I, I feel like it's it, part of it is becoming like an adult woman, a mom, and being like, okay, what do I want? Like, what will, like, things am I willing to sacrifice? And, mm-hmm. and one of the things I'm not willing to sacrifice is I just, and I'm processing this a little bit, I'm not willing to sacrifice their childhood innocence. And, but yeah, I know that that will be lost at some point. And It's this weird, you know, I can't protect them from everything. That's not my goal. The goal of parenting is not isolation. It's filtration. And that's where I'm at, where I want to be able to filter. Yes. And in order to filter, I need to know what they're receiving. And so that's kind of where I'm at with my process. I don't want you gone from me all day. I don't know what you filtered as a two-year-old, the conversations you heard, the books you were read, all those things. But I also don't want to isolate you. I don't want you to be so like, uh, you know, unaware of what's out there that you don't know how to function. I mean, I even think of Princess Diana. Great example. Princess Di used to take the boys out, uh, sneak them out of the, you know, royal castle. Love it. And pass the guards and would show her boys like under the bridges and like the homeless people and those poor off to show them that like not everybody has it as good as you. And these are the people that need help. And there are things worth fighting for. So I, I think that's something I admire about you and Enriquez too, as just mom friends, is whatever you choose to do, they know that your children are watching and listening and how you even choose to talk about the world and work. You know, I try and tell Grace who can process, like, I'm going on this trip because I need to help moms and babies. And she's like, okay. Yeah. I'm like, what do you think I should say to them? You know, or, you know, what do you think, what kind of babies do you think they're going to be? Like, I, I try to invite her in and just, like kind of that princess die analogy of like, I'm going to show you and I'm going to help you filter what's mm-hmm. going on so you mm-hmm. can be a part of the good and part of the solution. 
Well, that's so good because it's actually reminding me like when we work, whether in terms of paying work, whether it's full time, whether it's part time, whether it's a home business, whether it's even a podcast that that we're anything that basically I would say is outside of the realm of parent. It's an opportunity to also show our children what obedience to God looks like. And so, yeah, when I was traveling, you know, when I was working there at the end, I was traveling probably every 10 days and I had uh, three, then four kids. And it's hard when you leave, but you're explaining to your kids why, you know, I think the why is really important for why am I doing this job? Is it because it makes me a better mom because I get a chance to step away and focus my energy somewhere else? Is it because I'm fighting for a cause uh, that is near the heart of God? Is it because this is how God has chosen to provide for our family? And being able to help our kids understand that helps them see like, this is what it looks like to follow God. And there is sacrifice involved. And it may be sacrifice for all of us. It may be a shorter, you know, different kind of sacrifice. But yeah, that's so good to invite our kids into those conversations. And, you know, we're the weird family. They're like, my girls know now, every morning we drive by Planned Parenthood and somebody prays because my job, having worked in the pro-life movement by necessity, sort of forced those conversations. But my kids are now very aware of what's going on in the world. And, and they know that, yeah, there's good and there's evil and God is gracious and, and all that. So I love that. And maybe maybe that's part of it as we're discerning, you know, to work or not work, how much work to do. What is our why that motivates us to be doing that job? Because we need to explain that to our kids. And if it's, I need a break from you because you drive me nuts, maybe you need a different why. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's a really good point. I mean, a lot of the women that responded to my like thoughts on bringing children home from school and what you do at Christian school or homeschooling, not one homeschooling mom was like, don't do it. They were all like, this is amazing. It's the best. Da, da, da. And I've noticed in parenting, you can have a lovely time with children as long as you have nothing else to do. Like Truth. I have the best days, as long as I have nowhere to be, no deadlines, no calls, like it's delightful. So I think that's part of it is, is who am I to them when I have a deadline, yeah. when I have something that I feel is compelling me to, to, to do something outside of parenting in that moment. Like, and it might be, it might be like just making something for like a sick neighbor. Uh, it might be a work thing. It might be walking with one of my family members through a hard time. But especially in raising littles, it can be all encumbered. Like not mm-hmm. almost not like I don't want to say navel gazing, but you're just like, has everyone eaten? Have you slept? Have you eaten? Slept? How are you doing? Everyone's here, and you forget the world out there for a little bit. And I, I think one thing I'm trying to do is no matter what the schooling situation is, make sure that my girls see me looking out and talking out of like, hey, Miss Nancy down the street is sick. Let's make her a card. That'll be like our activity before bed. Like thinking of those ways. So whether she was with me or not all day, or that's like our last hour before bed, just thinking of other people because God has called us to be a blessing Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. others in in our city. And they're little and yours are getting a little bit bigger, but that to me is going to be more important and powerful than anything. Like you do in your work world, but you're so good at what you do they're going to grow up with a mom that was like always accessible and available for them and other people. And I think that's, I mean, you're making great kids. You continually making, every time I see them and interact with them, they're lovely. And they are fun. God will use them. And and what does God call children? (laughs) Blessings. This was one big thing too. When I was married, when I was first married and we were considering starting a family, I was terrified. Like, Oh, I remember. Terrified. There's a crazy moment of me like crying in lingerie, like, I don't know if we should do this. And it's funny because I'm not, like, other girls have told me they've been scared too, or that they yeah. are, you know, they're not even dating yet. And they're like, of course, it's the great unknown. And I really had to challenge myself. And it's probably a good thought process to go back and do of like, what does the Bible say about children? The yes. Bible says yes. that children are a blessing. So I have to take God at his word. And I'm like in my 20s living in DC with this like cute, awesome husband. I'm traveling and I'm like, where are we going to put a child? Where are we going to put the crib? What if we never travel again? What if we never have fun again? Like what, what if, what if, what if? And thank God my sweet husband's like, 
first off, we're going to do all of those things just with a kid. Second yep. off, we don't have to do this right now because you're snotting. You're literally <laughs> crying snot. So this is, we're done here. And, <laughs> and I, I just think going back to the basics of like, okay, God calls children a blessing. I'm going to have to believe him on that and see it. And I have seen it. I really yes. have seen it, which is oh, so- you, And you travel so well, actually, with kids. I'm constantly amazed. Mm-hmm. You take them everywhere with you when you're doing work things. And I actually often left my kids at home. I was like, I'm in work mode. And I'm always amazed watching you do it because I'm like, that's so hard. And yet you make it look effortless uh, because that's how what you have prioritized. And and so I think the beauty in that is that you can still do these things. Sometimes it takes a little more creativity to figure out how, but listen, I'm mm-hmm. with you. When I got pregnant with our first, I cried and they were not happy tears. And and then as a as a follower of Christ, you you are convicted. You realize like, wait a second, this is the world's thinking about motherhood mm-hmm. and about work and value and identity. I mean, there's so much, you and I were saying like, there's so much we could unpack around this because it, it it's also about like, where do I find my value? Am, is my identity as a mom? Is it as a fundraiser? Is it as a this, that, or the other? And, and you're so right to look at scripture and say, but what does scripture say? If, if God promises that children are a blessing, um, then I have to believe that. There's no caveat. There's no like, except when they're throwing a tantrum, unless you have a job that pays you X amount. Uh, <laughs> so, But then I also see so many women in scripture who were multifaceted. You know, Abigail uh, was an asset to David because she put the whole camp in order and she was wise about business and organizing things. And you have, of course, Proverbs 31. She's taking care of her family. She's buying property. Like she's doing all the things. Mm-hmm. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila, they're teaching Together, they have a, a joint ministry. And and so, yeah, that reminder of like, God doesn't forget us, but God is always loving us enough to call us into deeper faith. And what that expression looks like will be different um, as the years go by. That's really good. Joe, I think you need to do like a separate thing on all of these amazing women and what they did in the Bible. Just rattled <laughs> off these women and be like, good you luck, friends, go find them. them. <laughs> do I know all these stories? <laughs> I think I need to go read them. You should. You really should. That's really good. I'll put them in the show notes. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and we'll we'll end with this. I, you know, I think wherever you are as you're listening to this, it, the reality is that in no other, in no other place, are women as valued and seen as they are through the cross. Like now people misinterpret that people totally take scripture and they twist it and they whatever. But really, when you look at scripture and you look at what Jesus did for women, he loved women. He pursued women. He he pointed them out. He he affirmed them. And so for us, as we're all wrestling, whether you're, you know, you're not married and you're trying to figure out, oh my goodness, are kids going to ruin my life? They won't. I've had more professional success because of kids than not. Uh, you know, if you're working and you're like, am I a terrible mom because of this? You're not because God loves your children uh, even more than you do. And and he knows what is needed for them. Or if you're staying home, you're like, I'm slowly dying on the vine. God sees you. You're not forgotten. And only do we really find that in the cross that says women are as valued and as cherished um, as the men that have been created and the skills that we have been given, the, the abilities, they're intentional. And God is going to use that to bless our homes, if we have kids, to bless the world, kind of both. It's, I mean, it's really fun. I love being a woman, but it's taken me to my mid thirties to really be able to embrace that. <laughs> True, and we're different than than guys, and that's good. And there's many things that we do better and differently. And I, yeah. I think you're right. We've grown up in a culture of osmosis, and when we feel those fears, we have to realize, mm. like, duh, no wonder we're scared. We've been hearing in every magazine, in yeah. every commercial, everything is like, do not do, even from our parents, do not get pregnant. <laughs> it's like, get your education out. done, figure out your career, and then you can have kids. Yeah. 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 And, and so no wonder it like has affected us and impacted us, but to be on the other side of it now and to go back and like laugh at the the girl who was afraid of it, because the strength that you bring to the world applies to children and they are so stinking fun. And I'm just figuring this out. I am so glad that I have a tribe of women if there's any advice I can give, no matter what situation you're in, just to find your tribe of women that cheer you on yes. in the throes of it, that you text when your kid has a high temperature or a hilarious thing they said, because I just know that we weren't meant to do this alone. 
And, you know, thankfully, Joe and I have great husbands and nothing replaces another woman who gets it like you do. I mean, our, our husbands are amazing. Amazing. But just really find are. women and, and and utilize things like this, like Joanne and Lauren's show or Instagram, just to reach out and 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 get the connection you need to do it. You're not alone in it. And of course, I'll end in this. I've been thinking a lot about, of course, motherhood is under attack. Mm. And it's because it is so important and it's so um needed in the world right now is to have sound, calm, steady beacons of truth. And that's us. That's that's our opportunity at home and out outside of our home to bring truth and to be that place of of connection. And that's what we all crave. And God made us that way to crave belonging. And so yeah. whether that's your biological children or other people in your life, so that they know they matter. They know they were born on purpose with a plan and a purpose. And you bring that to the world. I think that's your, your goal, whether whether you're a male or a female. Love it. Allison, where can our listeners find you if they want to connect with you? Oh, come on. Find me on Instagram. I love it there. That's my chosen platform. Allison Santafante. I don't even know my handle. Underscore. We'll link in the show notes. (laughs) Find it there. Go through Joanna's friends. Find me. Um, Twitter, I don't love as much, but I'll, I'll, I'll see you on Instagram. Instagram's good. Allison's great. She does a lot of stories. She makes you feel like you're just in it with her and she's fantastic. So I'm terrible at posting and I just watch Allison. It's great. Hey, <laughs> thank you for coming on and just thank having just having one of our conversations. So fun. So fun for people to finally meet you. And if you're listening and you, you know, have questions about what we talked about, or there's more that you want to tell us, like, how are you making it work? Or you're aching to say like, I would love to have the problem of figuring out how to be parenting and working. Like we want to hear from you. Wild and beautiful podcast at gmail.com. Um, of course, share, rate, all the things, but We are cheering for you in whatever season you're in, and we can't wait to talk to you next week. In the meantime, stay wild and beautiful. 